Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Why Can't We Just Do What's Right? Forming a New Political Center in an Environment that Rewards Political Polarization. I'd like to welcome Michelle to the stage to introduce our next panelist. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here today. And I want to start off by thanking everybody in the community for taking time to participate in the conference. I don't know about you, but it's just been a breath of fresh air for me uh, to really be thinking bigger and, and thinking about different things, especially since so many of us have had our head down with issues related to the pandemic. Um, so thank you to Glenn. Thank you to the entire community uh, for, for putting this on. So our panel today is, uh, if we were going to put it into one word, it would be probably talking about the word centrism in political movements. And that can be a very taboo word uh, when it comes to political movements. So how we're going to break down the session today is we've got three broad themes. The first relates to the current state of uh, various political movements around the world. We want to explore why, um, why polarization is rewarded. Is polarization necessary? Then we want to look at the future state. Is there a better way of doing things? And I know that many of the other speakers in the conference have spoken to this to a certain extent already. Um, and then we want to end off with how do we get to that future state and what can the RxC community do to move, uh, move those the, the the goals, move towards the goals. So I'm very uh, blessed to be joined today by two outstanding, strong women um, who are very well versed in this political topic, our particular topic. And I'd like to introduce them. First, uh, we have Diana Rodriguez Franco. Uh, Diana is the secretary for women in the city of Bogota, one of my favorite country, uh, cities in the world. I am biased. Mm -hmm. um, she holds a PhD. Uh, and an MA in sociology from Northwestern University uh, and a BA from the University of uh, Columbia. She is previously the direct, um, deputy director at the Center of Law, Justice and Society and a head of its environmental justice division. And she has been a lecturer at the University of Los Andes. She has this extensive CV of very well uh, received articles. Um, I could spend the entire panel read, uh, read them to you, but Diana is very well versed in this topic and is an accomplished academic. So welcome, Diana, and thank you for taking time out of your busy day. And then Elena, Elena Landau uh, has an equally impressive CV, a PhD in economics. Um, she started that at the Mass Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a master's degree in economics, um, and uh, has among ma making major reforms in her country, regulatory reforms, which are very impressive, and I encourage you to read on them. Uh, she is the she's the chairwoman of a very intriguing political movement uh, called Livres. And maybe what I'll do is, uh, Elena, I'll just pass it over to you and to Diana, maybe just to make some brief opening remarks about your background uh, and about this topic, and then we can jump right into uh, d the discussion of the first topic. So Diana, you go first. <laughs> Diana, you go ahead. I go okay, ahead. Okay. Elena, you uh, go I'm, ahead. I'm I'm an economist and a lawyer, much older than you girls. <laughs> and um, uh, I started uh, as an economist. Then I working at, at the government in the privatization process in Brazil, together with the team of Fernanda Henrique Cardoso during the real plan. Um, I start to question myself about regulation, what kind of regulation we should have to make sure that privatization would reach the goals of efficiency and, and competition that we had. So I start to study law. And recently, uh, because of polarization in Brazil, and I start to concentrate my studies on the liberal, the classical liberal movement, not liberal in the United States sense, but liberal in the sense of the continental. So we could put together uh, concerns about uh, the agenda pro, pro women, pro human rights, pro LGBT together with the agenda of free market, free trade. And that is Livres. It's a, a broad movement center because in Brazil center is this liberal classic concept you know you can do both in your that's what I'm working on 
Diana. Okay, well, thank you. I just want to join Michelle in thanking everyone for this invitation and for really having the time to just stick my head out of uh, the pandemic for a second. And um, so, as Michelle said, I I've done my my life basically in human rights, both in academia and more in the applied um, NGO world. And uh, six months ago, I was appointed to be part of the cabinet of Claudia Lopez, who is the first woman to be elected mayor of Bogota. And also to my knowledge, she's the first now, the first openly gay woman to be elected in office in Latin America. So it's a profound, um, rich moment to be, right? It's, it's my first time in a, in a government job. And, um, and so it's a challenge in every way. And it's really a challenge um, from a gender perspective as well. Thank you, Diana. And, and I'll just briefly introduce myself. My name is Michelle Rempel Garner. I'm a member of parliament uh, from Canada. I serve as the vice chair of our standing committee on industry. I have served in the executive as an economic minister under Prime Minister Stephen Harper. I, um, my background is an economist by training as well. Um, and I've also served as the shadow minister for citizenship and immigration and led an, an initiative to recognize the Yazidi genocide and bring uh, survivors of sex slavery to Canada as refugees, um, among many other things. Um, but I, I, I guess this is a, my introduction would be a good launch into our first question in that um, my party is the Conservative Party of Canada. And I would identify my personal political politics probably more as centrism. A lot of what you just said, Elena, which is, you know, I, I believe that we should be striving towards upholding individual freedoms, um, that the the role of the state should be limited, but the state also has a, a, a very important role in removing barriers to equality of opportunity and upholding uh, democratic principles that allow for a pluralism like Canada to maintain and, and thrive. Um, and, and a lot of that, you know, for me means removing theocracy from government. Um, it means removing, um, it means ensuring that people have uh, understand that they have an individual responsibility both either as legislators or members of the electorate in participating in democracy um, that it's not someone else's job and that um, I, I think that our, our democracy I've been in politics now for 10 years I've been elected nearly 10 years and in that time I'm you know I, I think that those principles for me have become really crystallized while the political environment around me has become much more polarized. So let's jump right into our, our discussion about the current state. So the questions that we had posed um, as a group to the community for this panel under current state was why are current political movements so polarized? And are non-polarized movements inherently good or do we actually need polarization? And what are the impacts of polarization? So um, Elena, do you wanna jump into that from your perspective, especially given your your, your background in, in founding this very innovative political movement? Yes, yes. First, I, I have to tell so, uh, that I'm so honored to be in this panel with you guys because you have amazing <laughs> job I've done an amazing job and and i'm so honored you know i think polarized in brazil we have to see the perspectives of different countries because in brazil we have 36 parties it's not like usa when you say polarized you know have a two party and it's quite impossible to avoid uh going through those two uh, guys you know alternative but what I think is amazing in Brazil, that despite we have so many uh, parties, we still have a very polarized election and discussion uh, uh, in Brazil. Uh, it's been like this for the last 20 years, you know, since Fernando Henrique Cardoso left the job. Uh, it's against Fernando Henrique and then it's against Lula and now it's against Bolsonaro. And, 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 and I don't think it helps at all. I don't think it helps because you keep um, change the people that you are against for, but you never go through what you are in favor for, you know? And, and, and I don't think polarization helps. And uh, that's why in Livres, this movement, we try, uh, we have some um, um, 
representative in, di in many different, you know, layers of uh, federal or state or municipalities that all work in this centuries, in the centuries, you know, uh, avoid, uh, to avoid to vote against for, to have an agenda of everything Michelle ha has said before. And um, the problem we have to ask ourselves is because it's why the center have, hasn't succeeded in the last five elections. What is wrong with us, you know? <laughs> What's wrong with us? Because uh, in Brazil, uh, the election, we have two terms, uh, two rounds in the election. If the candidate doesn't get the majority in the first round against everybody else, they go the second round, the two first, you know? And always we have center, Candidates, but we never reach the second the second round. Like, like the center has it doesn't go together and as a group, and that's I think we we should go in the last question to discuss what is going on now that people are realized that we cannot go in the polarization anymore. Nobody wants to vote against something any anymore. People are tired of that of hating or find an enemy. We want to find something that we believe for our country, for our kids, for the next generation. And that's why I think those move movements of centuries now, especially with Bolsonaro, that is a such bad experience. I think we can flourish in now. That's, that's the big opportunity in Brazil right now. I, so I Diana, did you want to build Diana, did you want to build on anything that uh, Elena just said? I actually have a couple of questions for Elena, but I'm sure I'm going to have questions for you as well. Too, so go ahead, Diana. Go ahead. So I'll just um, start addressing some of the questions we, we put forward, right? So I would like to begin with a basic, but very fundamental and conceptual difference, which I think is key to thinking about polarization, but in particular to its alternative. And it's the difference between polarization is not the same as disagreement. And I, again, I insist, it's pretty basic, but I think it's necessary for us to be able to think about an alternative, right? And disagreement means to differ in opinion. Um, and in politics in particular, well, it means discrepancy over ideas on how to solve public policy problems, right? Um, polarization, however, is not just having discrepancy in opinions. It means a sharp division, right? And it means, and it lives of loathing and intolerance and it entails feelings of hate right towards your opponent's idea and mm -hmm. so and thus um i'll put it right there and i'll elaborate it later but i do not believe we need polarization i think we need disagreement and i think we need staunch and profound disagreement in especially in cases of profound social injustices right but we don't need polarization and so why then if we don't need it, why do we have it? And why are we seeing it so vividly, right? Um, and I don't think there's a single answer, of course, but they're rather a combination of factors right, that range all the way from biology to social media to political sociology. And I can't address them all, but I'd like to pepper a few, right? So biology, I think Robert Sapolsky, the biologist and behavioral scientist, right? He argues, us and them is a fundamental fault line in our brains. And I think that explains a lot, or at least we're building a lot on that. And, and, and polarization is feeding a lot on that fact, right? Basically our brains tend to divide the world into us and them. And even if we, of course, belong to different us and them groups, right? It's very easy to manipulate us into who is us and who's them. And so, I really think that political movements are so polarized because they're consciously or unconsciously appealing to base, ba very basic human behavior. And by this, I do not say I, I do not want to meet. I do not want to say that we're innately polarized, right? That we were born polarized. No, I don't want to have these uh, this argument. But rather that we as humans are easily polarizable, right? And given the way we're wired, and that the parties are feeding on that. I also think that parties are more and more polarized because the social media facilitates it and exacerbates yes. it. And we can't put that away, right? I think, simply put, on Twitter, there's no characters for nuance. There's no space for nuance. It's costly to try to do nuance on Twitter, right? 
Um, and then I do yeah. think that <laughs> attracts the spotlight, right? So extremes get more attention by the news and social media again. And it's a strategy that politicians, and I'm of course not saying everyone, reach out to be noticeable, right? Um, I guess I'll stop there and, and then we can talk more about are they inherently good or and think about why or why not. Yeah, and building off of that, you know, from my lived experience, what I would say is, you know, polarization, I would I would almost make that synonymous with hyperpartisanship. And one of the things that I I think happens in a hyperpartisan or polarized situation among the other things that you talked about Diana is that it's almost like a religious adher adherence to dogma and your ability to no matter what only toe the party line or or adhere to dogma is is something that is 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 politically rewarded right i mean uh, for example in a in the canadian system or in the westminster system where members of the executive are appointed from elected representatives um, that is a dangling carrot that the leader of the governing party will use to reward religious adherence or dogmatic adherence to to the party doctrine and i think the impact of that is that we don't undertake as legislators in that scenario the rigorous review of policy that we have in the past in our democracies right like in the past it was politically acceptable to say okay here's an idea here's what I think is in the best interest of my community. Uh, this is why. Here's a bill. Let's debate it. And even within your own party stripe, you could say, well, I, I like that, but you haven't thought of this. Or, you know what, I really don't like that. And I don't think we should do that. And it's disagreement or questioning the dogma is actually something that is politically, it, it, it's actually disincentivized in every, in every part of the political system right now. And I think that that actually makes for poor public policy. And then, you know, I think Elena and Diana, you both sort of alluded to what I would call tribalism, right? Um, I think that um, what has happened, especially with social media, where political engagement now in, in many situations equates to clicks and likes and dislikes or whatever, that um, th that 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 is what some people think is political engagement. Um, and maybe it is. That would be an interesting discussion in and of itself. But with government becoming so ubiquitous in many G7 countries and many uh, you know, emerging democracies where the role of the state, the state has expanded so much and it's ubiquitous, I do feel that polarization and that adherence to dogma allows for the electorate or legislators to abdicate their responsibility to question what is being proposed by the executive, by government, or even by the judiciary, law enforcement, whatever, and just say it's sort of someone else's job because my team is doing it right. My team can't be wrong. And when you, in any organization, when you lose the ability to question dogma, when the ability for somebody to say, you know what, we're at risk because this is no longer good policy. And that that question, that constructive, that creative dissent is 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 not valued. I think that you actually start exposing your country to risk or your jurisdiction to risk, and that has been my experience. And that's why you know I have become you know I've got in the last few years I've had a re reputation for good or for ill for being a bit of a maverick, because I'm not going to just toe the party line if it's not what's right for my community. So um, you know I think that that. I don't know if you guys want to add anything to that before we move on to point two. No, I, I, I think Diana uh, really, and you both said something very important is the message. Because Twitter doesn't accept, is no place for nuance. I think the most difficult thing now is get the message of a radical center. Because our message, we cannot put in, 280 characters. There's no the hate message is much more strong than that. The the negative agenda is much more strong than, than a than a positive agenda. And um, in the tribalism in Brazil is so strong that, for instance, um, in last election, uh, it was a huge mov movement from the center that that couldn't vote in the second round. You know, mm -hmm. we are not to, uh, there to vote against something, but both candidates didn't show anything that we were willing to, to fight for. We had a, 
a preview, a candidate that could be um, establishment of Peron in Brazil, a Peronism in Brazil. Diana knows what that means. And the other candidate would be a Chavez in Brazil. So why I, I would go to vote for them? And if people, instead of uh, understand the position of us that couldn't go to vote, because in Brazil is a compulsory vote, you, you don't have the option. It's part of your civil duty to vote. Now that Bolsonaro showed that he is as bad as we imagined, that he's a fascist, people are kind of blaming the centrists and that we didn't vote that we are responsible for Bolsonaro instead of reflecting it's because why they, what they did wrong, so wrong that he, even though Bolsonaro was so bad and everybody knew, there is no surprise, it's, even though we didn't have the, 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 the willingness to vote, you know, instead of make a, self, a, a reflection, what, what happened is just tribalism. We are never wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. Wrong is the people that didn't vote on us. That you were wrong. We are not wrong. So that's the, I so, think. So that's a, actually, I was going to say this is a really nice bridge. Like you've naturally bridged us into the second topic about what defines a po successful political movement. Um, what are some examples to emulate or exclude? And um, why do non-polarized movements succeed or fail? And I think you've, you've Elena, alluded to something that, that happens a lot of time, which is, I call it the vote splitting canard. So mm -hmm. if you, a lot of people will say, well, you know, I, I, I either have to vote far left or far right. Um, I can't vote for an individual who might vote one way or one issue or, 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 or have a set of principles as opposed to a set of dogma because I'm going to split the vote. Um, so I think that that actually is very valid in terms of a reason why centrist movements have failed. Um, I, I don't know, Diana, did you want to, to, to add to Elena's comments or start bridging into your comments on the second set of questions? I'm happy to go into the second just because uh, in sake of time, I think it's good. Well, sure. So thinking, I actually come on this second part, right? Like, which is are all the questions are, are there some good examples to emulate? Is there something relevant in the current global context? And actually Bogota brings a positive note on this end. And it's precisely because for, right? Um, well, the mayor is widely considered the second most important political post in Colombia after the presidency, right? And in Colombia, polarization has been the norm of politics in the last decade. In particular, and I wouldn't say only because of that, but over the peace agreement with the oldest guerrilla group in the Western Hemisphere, right, with the so-called mm -hmm. FARC. Um, yet, we're starting to see the rise of the center, as opposed to what both Elena was saying in Brazil, you were saying, Michelle, we're seeing that actually centrism is starting to flourish, right? And despite the fact that politics remains highly polarized, right? So I think that's also an important issue to consider is we don't need necessarily only a reduction or a in polarization to see the emergence of a center, right? And we're seeing, and especially if we go back to Twitter, we could say something that we're seeing that politics on Twitter is diverging from politics on the battle, on the ballot, right? Because on Twitter, it remains insanely polarized, but on the ballot, um, it was clear last election, and that was in October, in the local elections, that citizens are looking actually for centrist candidates. And starting to define yourself as centrist was attracting, was appealing. And so let me just say a word on how that played out. So in Colombia, like, so this, the mayor, Claudia Lopez, um, I told she won with 37% of the vote. And she's a journalist, academic, turned politician. She's a member of the Green Party Alliance. Uh, right. And uh, as I said, she's a, as I said in my introduction, she became the first woman to be elected mayor of Bogota. Right. But interestingly, and I think it's more interest, even more interesting that the fact that Claudia was uh, one is the fact that she narrowly beat a second candidate called Carlos Galan, who received 34 percent of the vote. And both of them define themselves and campaigned overtly as candidates from the center. So not only did we have one candidate winning, as right, in a, but two candidates that came very close to each other, 
both of them uh, defining themselves overtly as candidates of the center. And it was not only, right, both in the, like for the mayor election, it was also for council, the city council, interestingly, that of the 45 elected members, right, there was this interview this, uh, that was conducted and asking about their ideological position, one third of them identify themselves both during and after, which I think makes a difference, as center candidates. So we're starting to see that. And I'm not gonna take all the time, but I just wanna say that there's a few factors which are also interesting and I think are correlated. I don't think they're causal, but I do think there's a correlation. More women and younger candidates mm. also playing a role. I think the three yes. combinations of being overtly center, women playing a role and younger candidates on both, on both ballots, both for mayor and for both for city council, is a, like a good strong recipe for probably seeing a stronger emergence of center parties. Yeah. Elena, would you agree? I actually, I, I do find, um, I find like, on the point of adding more women and younger people to this, I, I, hey, we've got an all female panel, so let's take advantage of it. Um, <laughs> my, my, my lived experience has been like, I certainly have learned how to assert myself in a male dominated environment. Um, but I, my experience has been that women are more collaborative, but also more susceptible to pressure from, from a party center or party leadership to, um, to, to fall off, especially if they've been tokenized by oh, the party, exactly. right? Um, so it's this balance of you want to add women, but you want to make sure that women are there in a position where, where, where their backing and their, um, their base, if you will, is such that they can, they can push the party one way or the other so that they're not just there, uh, the, the party isn't able to tokenize them or the center or whatever the political center is. I don't know. I mean, I know we're diverging slightly and I'll get into the next one, but I do think that this is, I, I do think that this is a relevant topic. I, I really do. I totally agree. The movement that I'm, I'm chair, chairwoman, it's, uh, uh, as we call in Brazil, political renovation. You know, mm -hmm. many uh, kind of uh, NGOs financing uh, new leader leadership in, 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 in the political parties, in the political arena. And the best outcome was now in the Congress, in the federal government, we have so many young and diversity and pushing forward good agendas. And that's why I couldn't agree most with, with Diana, but before you jump to the next question, I have to tell Diana how envy I am over. <laughs> being from Rio, being from Rio, you know, with gorillas and militias and everything and see what Bogota became, you know. Yes. I, I hope one day we get there and only mm -hmm. through political renovation and center and breaking all this old chain of how political uh, politics work. So I'm envy. <laughs> I hope I live up to your expectations, Elena. <laughs> I'm envy, so go ahead. So as we move into the next topic here, just for those who are watching, I do encourage you to put your questions into the chat so that we can prepare to open it up to Q&A after this section. And also, this, this should be a collaborative dialogue because we want to hear from you. And the question really is, uh, you know, how do we move forward in creating successful, positive political movements? You know, is centrism part of that? And how do we do it? Because I find that, the, I think we all find here that the conversation is always stuck on, well, you know, Twitter sucks or you know it, it's a we are so polarized but what do we need to do to move forward and the the other comment the other question that often comes up in our forums are or for i is is change with from within possible so within existing political systems or do our political systems um do, do they lack the ability to 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 reward um centrism um so with that, you know, Elena, do you want to launch into it? And, um, and then again, just an, an encouragement to the audience to, to put your questions forward. You know, I think it, uh, first, uh, Twitter sucks, but we don't live without it. You <laughs> have to use it, you know, and learn how to use it. You know, I'm a sure. little, 
Uh, I'm, I think Brazil was, uh, has never been such a, a, such a bad situation that we are now, you know, in cold terms, you know. And, and this is good and bad at the same time, depends how you look at it, because Bolsonaro is the image of the failure of polarization, you know, because to avoid the other guy, we got into uh, some uh, obscure guy in the sense that we knew him, but something people this decide to jump from that, from from this adventure, and it, it got wrong. It's it's the worst possible, you know. So now we are beginning to see people, for instance. Uh, old enemies that were like, uh, instead of debate or, or discrepancies, there were enemies, signed together uh, petitions and, and, and newspapers, ads and manifestos and things against Bolsonaro. So put a lot of people from different parties together because, but again, it's not because we have an agenda, but again, because we have somebody that we don't like. It's always negative. People say that is the first step. Doesn't mind if you are uh, putting together people that doesn't think alike, which is good for the debate. It doesn't matter that it's still a movement on the negative agenda because it is the first step to, act, to actually to have people working together. You know? So uh, this could be... The other thing that we have to have in mind is how we... Uh, send the message in a country and Diana has the experience you don't have as much Michelle in a country in, in a continent that's dominated by populism you know sure that, that for me this from is from the, the left and the right <laughs> yes. left and right and the right that's why, that's why I said Peron and Chavez and because Chavez. That's why we're facing less less election, you see. So how to get the message when the people are very poor, inequality of, uh, of income is so high, and then you have the populism is so easy to get through this mess. Everything is easy when you have a populist uh, running for election because they can make any kind of promises and, and people, you know, they promise a wonderful life with not, no responsibility. So this is the first thing I think we have to address in this new movement, how to fight populism, how to find a, a, a message that is a Twitter message for the center, you know, something that people can grasp, can understand that will make his life better. Because sometimes yes. you have the good is with the left, because the left only uh, is the only that uh, it's concerned about inequality, uh, fiscal policy and a state is the one to do that. And then you have the right saying, oh, no, we don't want diversity. This is the, the, like the market works. So I think we have to find this message, a strong message. And I think radical uh, RXC can help with that. You know, being radical center, we have to find a radical center message to get through people and 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 to get uh, avoid the trap of the, the good guys and bad guys you know the left is always good the right is always bad you have to show another you know character in this in this in this play you know diana yeah so so thinking about how do we get there i I really like the question you posed, uh, Michelle, about so what can this radical exchange community take to help foster, right? Like, what can, it, what can we all do? And I think there's a few things we could do. I think we need to bring back the attention to the public good, constantly to the public good. And that should be uh, building on what Elena was saying. If there's one message we have to get through is the public good, right? It, avoiding the left, and the right and just bring back the attention. Also, I think it's worth a debate on the impacts polarization is having on ethics and morale and the fact that what are the values that we're valuing right now? Is it is it hating is now our way to prove political allegiance and loyalty instead of ideas? Um, behavior like compromising, discussing is all of a sudden not well, not appreciated 
but it's very being violent and radical and it, like violent on that end. So I do think we need to bring the debate on the moral and ethical impacts of polarization. And right, and, how, and, and what is that? Like what's the legacy this era is leaving to new uh, generations of people, just citizens engaged in politics. Also, I think NGOs, civil society can do a great deal in monitoring negative campaigns. And by that, I mean calling out and avoiding when campaigns are focused on negative campaigns like more on destroying their opponent's ideas rather than building up support. So you were talking about the all, 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 all women's panel as opposed to an all males panel. In a way, I think we could, civil society could do something along those lines and right, like raise the red flags, right? Remember there was this hashtag on, oh, you managed to do it. You got an all males panel again. Well, you could, civil society could start press, pressing on that and saying, oh, well, you managed to do it. You're not, you're not saying anything. You're not proposing anything. You're just constructing a negative campaign. The same thing, which I think hmm. you should call out demonizing, like those personally demonizing yeah. tactics. And what do I mean by that? I think that um, we should monitor when candidates or campaigns personally demonize their opponents. Like we should just stop at the moment when, for example, the news is asking, what do you think of this person? No, I don't think anything about this person. I think something about their ideas, right? And so I do think that civil society, especially using tools like Twitter for a positive thing, is just starting to raise the flags and stopping the negative campaigns, the personally demonizing tactics. And, um, and lastly, I think, in countries, especially like Brazil and Colombia, where the opposition might actually be in danger, right? Their lives in danger, um, right? Due to violence. I think there's, uh, we need to foster and protect the opposition party. So opposition is valued and we don't end up in polarization. So, so I, I would like to give comment to this as well, because I think you guys have just started to list this wonderful list uh, that I hope we could maybe even put forward as like a manifesto of some point. I think it's great. Um, um, but there, I think what I'll do is I'm going to bridge into some of the questions from the audience uh, and and because they, they tie nicely into this. And the first two, I think, actually relate to each other and they relate to my answer. So Colton Dillon had asked, centrists are defined by moderation, whereas grassroots movements require passion. What are your tools to put centrist boots on the ground and uh, evan ev evangelize? And Arturo Mar uh, Marcia said, are, do you think that the winner takes all electoral systems, so presidentialist, republic, or first past the post parliaments, encourage polarization? And I know this sounds counterintuitive, but I actually think one belies the other, and I'm going to use the Canadian context. So mm -hmm. if I was going to say, OK, what, what, do, what do grassroots movements, centrist grassroots movements require? Um, this is what I would say, and I would consider myself a centrist, um, and, and this is where I have succeeded. First of all, courage. Um, I think that um, courage is under-rewarded uh, in the political system until you're actually courageous, and then you get rewarded. The, the problem is, is that courage also comes with personal cost because you're attacked from both the left and the right, right? So if you, on a good day, if I put something forward and I'm called a pinko crazy commie and a right-wing fascist, I know I've probably got yeah. the spot <laughs> that is where we need to be, right? Uh, that's usually where my the barometer of my community is. And I think, and I know that sounds so, so, so silly, but we lack courage in politics. I really think that we do. I think that it is much easier um, that political systems reward towing the line, just voting, not really debating or, 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 or going outside of dogma. And I think to put boots on the ground, we need to have radical systems that actually promote bipartisanship and promote the puncture of dogma. Um, and, and I mean, there's, I could give you a million examples from the Canadian political context, but I think that we have to change hearts and minds that like dogmatic adherence to an idea, regardless of what it is, left or right on the spectrum, centrist on the spectrum, re uh, religious adherence to a dogma makes for poor public policy in the long run. And I think that that's something that it's a political principle that our community has to start uh, promoting in, in tandem with political um, 
campaigns. Um, I also think that, you know, Elena, you sort of related, you, you, you spoke to this, I would call it the something to vote for um, syndrome, right? Because I find that centrist movements, it's like, the message boils down to we're not that guy or that guy so just vote for us right and i think what we have to do is say okay yes we're not that guy or that guy but here's why we're way better here's what we're going to do for you and i think that there is an appetite in the public like that people that you know are average voters just to hear like look i i would like rights of gays per, to be protected the rights of women's to be protected i I'm, I'm not comfortable with the government intruding in x y and z area in my life but i want to make sure that there's a social safety net that's affordable and sustainable so if you can craft policy that kind of broadly hits some of those notes um, all of a sudden you've got a huge marketplace for voters and so i think that when i look at centrist movements um, they, that have been successful they've either hinged on a personality, which is not sustainable, it's not sustainable at all, as opposed to policy. And I've seen few centrist movements that have given their electorate something to vote for. And um, I think that's very important. Um, now, where the, um, the, the the question on electoral systems comes in for me on building a movement is in a, I'm going to use my national context as well as the American context, and I'm, you, you guys can speak for yourself, but Canada and the United States, they're both such geographically broad countries that, and they're also pluralisms, right? Um, so in, in the Canadian context, we have regional divisions that like we have different, we have balkanized regional economies we uh, different parts of the country do different things and there's different political cultures that are tied to our economy uh, and are, are tied to immigration patterns they're tied to you know colonization patterns they're tied to uh you know different political issues and i i also think that within that geographic context there's an urban rural divide and because of that a first past the post system actually encourages centrism because then you don't have regional parties emerging and you don't have religious parties emerging or ethnic based uh, parties emerging, which would receive votes in a proportional representation system. I am prepared to have my dogma challenged on that. Maybe it's better to move to prop rep systems to, to see that. I haven't been convinced of it because often what ends up happening is that you end up getting, um, you, you still end up getting a region of the country that is underrepresented um, in, in parliament because of that, just because of the regional divisions. But I think where that's overcome is, is by actually, if we can go back and reward that challenging ch challenge of dogma, if that's something that you have some courageous actors within political systems where we're challenging bipartisanship or, or rewarding bipartisanship or challenging of dogma, you're you start erasing some of the the problems with the political voting system because you've got individuals who are legislators who are taking that courage and, and making it incumbent upon themselves to to force change. Um, so, you know, Elena, I really liked your 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 you closed with the comment of. Um, you know, we need to give people different characters. It's like the good guy or the bad guy. And I, I agree with you. Like I often say, you know, I'll be like, oh, I'm the villain today, right? I feel like I'm the villain. And I, I think that, you know, to mobilize and put on the ground, we need to stop villainizing or making somebody heroic just because they adhere to a dogmatic rigid position that is not in the best interest of the community or or, or demonizing somebody who questions it um do you guys want to add to that now that i went on a rant and i will be quiet as the moderator from here on in yeah i know <laughs> yeah, you put so, so many things for us to, to think about i i would say at first different systems for the political system in Brazil is so corrupted that, that a lot of people became like the good carrot, just saying, I'm not going to use the public funds for that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reduce the number of people that are working in my cabinet. So it's things that should be like a normal, you know, a basic uh, path of an ethical and moral, like Diana said, way of behaving once you are in working the public interest became like a re reward or something that should be common sense. So the first thing is you have to understand that uh, Brazil and Latin America it's a very it's 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 a what other kind of world. So we have to think those characters. I think it and, and also 
um, if you if you think uh, you you ask the, the the question before that if you could change with him within the, the, the movements within the, the legal system, I think Brazil needs uh, a reform in our political system and political vote. First, we don't we need to have freedom to vote. It's not I I don't I'm not a better citizen just because I vote or I don't vote. You know, that's that's something that makes people uh, forced to, to choose things they don't want to choose or be blamed because they vote and somebody should be voted. It should be something, I want to be part of a, a, of a country. I want to, to vote. I want to choose because I want. That's the, that's the first thing. So in Brazil, we have so many parties because we have public funds. We have time on TV granted. It's kind of a, uh, uh, and then then they have a small part to sell the, the the funds and sell the TV time. So this cannot work, you know. Also, we have to go through parliamentarism. Presidentialism in Brazil is is for me um, a way to keep uh, keep a feeding populism in Brazil. Because it's this guy, my savior, we, you know, that's gonna change my life. This time, I'm gonna, I have a guy that's gonna change my life for me, instead of me being part of the discussion. So that's something in Brazil. We have this people expecting the big guy, the savior, this good guy, they to do something for me. Instead, I'm doing something right. on my own. And that I think individual responsibility. Diane, Elena, we're just we're at about five minutes before okay. the panel ends. So I just want to let another question. Sure, and then I'll let Diana. Another, a question for sure, Diane. Sure. And also, I think in this pa pandemic, the challenge is going to be worse because all the good guys, you know, taxations, and then you have immigration mm. problems. So that's why I, I think it's, if you could talk a little bit about the pandemic and the center. Sure. Diana, to you. Wow. Well, I think that's been that's been a challenge, especially because there's this difference between the party and the candidate having run as center, and then and non non as opposed to polarization, and the candidate or the leader being a polarizing person. That's two different things, right? Because you can be part of the center, and I'm going to speak uh, about my my boss, basically my the mayor, right? She ran as center. Right, we have centrist ideas, but now in the pandemic, constantly I find myself and the cabinet members trying to be pulled to extremes, right? Especially in the pandemic. What are you gonna do? This or that? Are you gonna do non-conditional right. cash transfers, which are like I've heard it within, like somebody even saying in my cabinet, non-conditional tra cash transfers, which are neoliberal, and I was shocked, and saying, or are we just gonna go out on the streets and get food to everyone and i'm saying okay we're this pandemic is forcing us to go to extremes and we constantly went back and said no we can we can need both and that's not the solution let us not the pandemic can't force us again to the extremes right uh, because i do think that's a challenge and not only within the city but also vis-a-vis -vis the national government right because there's a tendency of that constant comparison. I wanted to say something also about the first question, which if I understood correctly, it was trying to say that centrist is equal to moderation. And then the mm -hmm. grassroots movements can be more passionate. I don't think so. I think one of the things yeah. we need to do is to stop defining centrism as moderation and basically yes. as, as lame. We're not lame and we're not powerless and we do have passion, but I, we have to, and that's a change that has to come from within. Because centrism cannot be moderation, centrism cannot be being lame, and it can't be just being, oh, everybody else is passionate, we're not. Everybody else has staunch ideas and strong ideas, we don't know. There's just a willingness to think more strongly on the public good. There's more progressive ideas. There's a big awareness to social injustice, right? Uh, there's a strong belief in human rights. And I think that defines centrism more than if we're lame or, no, we're not lame. And we're not moderate. That is such an amazing.
interesting note to end this panel on because I couldn't agree more. I I think that there's so much to be passionate about, especially when it's not like, oh, well, this guy sucks, that guy sucks. It's it's more like, look, we've got great ideas here and we're courageous and this is the right thing to do. And so I, you know, I think that that's a beautiful note to end off of with two very, very strong colleagues that uh, there is hope. And I think that there's a lot of that passion within the RxC community. And I just encourage everyone to get on and I'd love to stay in touch with you two and maybe put a manifesto together. You never know. So I'm, I'm with that, Count thank you in. so much for, for participating and uh, to the rest of the community, thanks for spending your time over the weekend, uh, helping to make the world a better place. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Kelly Thank you for. It was lovely to meet you. It was Max. lovely. So honored to be here with you. <laughs> Likewise. Thanks. Have a great day.